All right, so good morning, everyone. My name is Jesse Hildebrand, and I'm here today for our Sharks for Kids Shark Week hangout with some jawsome women from the shark field. For those who don't know, Sharks for Kids is creating the next generation of ocean and shark ambassadors through outreach, education, and adventure. Today, I'm excited to say we're joined by four classes from across North America right now. Two are milling in, but while we're waiting for them, uh, our first class is Mrs. Templeton's grade four class from Round Rock, Texas. <laughs> awesome. We've got Mr. Baudouin's grade four class from Guelph, Ontario. They're excited. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> and then filling in so far, we've got Mrs. Robertson's grade two, three class from Toronto, Ontario. A matter of they're not here, but they're coming. <laughs> and then they'll, they'll be very excited. <laughs> they will later, yeah. And then we've got Mrs. Hastings Specs, six through eight in Brampton, Ontario. Uh, hi. <laughs> all right. Of course, the reason you're all here today is not to hear me talk. We are joined by Vicki Vasquez. She is a grad student and shark researcher in California. She has had a role in discovering new species of sharks, tracking sharks, finding rare sharks like the seven gill shark, and all around being a huge advocate and outreach champion for sharks generally. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Vicki. Thank you so, so much for joining us today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Hi, everybody. So um, normally when I talk, I notice that I'll pop up. Is it popping up for everybody else or am I still a small square? No, you're a big square. Okay, great. <laughs> Good. So um, what I wanted to do is just jump right into the PowerPoint, um, show you guys a little bit about um, my work. That way we have plenty of time for the questions. So I'm going to do a screen share now. So I'm going to say bye to everybody. Mm -hmm. And you can say hello to my PowerPoint. <laughs> so. Um, I wanted to talk to you all about uh, shark ecology and what it was like for me to get to where I am today. So um, what I do right now is two things. One, I'm a science communicator. And so I think it's really, really important to um, communicate your science, which basically means telling people about uh, what you do and what are the facts around it and how you got to those facts. I think those are really important stories to share with people. Um, the other thing that I currently am is a graduate student. So um, I work at a place called the Pacific Shark Research Center, and it's a small lab within a much bigger lab called Moss Landing Marine Labs, which is um, about two hours north of San Francisco. So in the picture, um, hopefully you guys can see my white arrow. I'm pointing to a skate. So this is just like a shark. Um, but they're called also flat sharks because they are cousins, but they're a little bit different as you can see. So um, first question is, what is shark ecology? So it obviously starts with sharks, but I'm also interested in the roles that sharks play ah, go too fast, uh, in their ecosystems. So um, I want to know what happens in an ecosystem um, when sharks aren't there. I want to know how sharks make an ecosystem um, special. So uh, the way I got into sharks is actually through white sharks. So a lot of people um, are really into white sharks. I'm definitely one of them. And it all started from fishing. So you see one picture of me where I'm very small. And that is me fishing with my grandpa in Venezuela. And then there's another picture of me um, with my uh, dad and some of my um, other family uh, fishing in San Diego. So from all of this fishing experience, I got a chance to go on a five-day fishing trip. I was the only girl on this boat, and for five days, I slept on this teeny tiny skinny bunk that you see right here, and the whole goal was to catch really big fish, so I was really excited, really wanted to show everybody that I could catch the biggest fish that was tough as everybody else, and then this happened. 
So what you're all looking at is a picture of a fish head. So as I was fishing, about to catch the biggest fish of the whole trip, somebody yelled, shark! And it turned out to be a great white shark. So all this effort I put into fishing, this really big fish was ruined because a great white shark came and bit it. Now, the face that I'm making here, I'm not disappointed that um, I lost my, sh uh, my fish. I'm actually really surprised because the fish head in this picture is actually still breathing. Now, for some of you, that might sound really scary, but for me, I thought it was really interesting because what I realized was that white sharks are actually really good predators. So that meant that that shark was really good at coming over to that fish and biting it quickly. And when I saw this happen, it didn't look scary. It actually looked more like if you ever play Pac-Man and Pac-Man goes over to those one of those little white circles and eats it, it looked like that. So that showed me how good a shark was at being a predator without trying to be scary. So I wanted to learn more. And that brought me to South Africa. And there was a little town there called Mossel Bay. So what you're seeing in this picture is me sitting at the edge of the boat waiting for a white shark to come over. Um, so this is a fun little side note because some of you might be thinking like, what if the shark comes, you might fall in. Well, actually, sharks can't swim backwards. So if the shark would, would have come over at this particular point, it would have been coming forward. So I wouldn't have fallen into the boat. But now I want to show you some of the pictures from South Africa. So South Africa, here's a picture of Africa. It's right here in the very bottom, uh, the very tip of the continent. And then we zoom into that tip of the continent. Um, Cape Town, if you're ever watching TV, is a very famous place where you'll see white sharks on TV. But if we move over to this red circle, that's Mossel Bay. So it was a very small town to study the white sharks there. And in order to get those white sharks over, you have to chum the water. That means you have like fish juice and it puts out a smell and it brings the sharks closer. But we wanted the sharks really close. So then I have this tuna steak. And one of the important things for um, you guys to know is that we're not feeding the sharks. It's very important for us not to feed the sharks. But we wanted to attract them over. And so the tuna steak helps get them really close to the boat. But with all the fish guts and that steak in the water, it still didn't mean we had a shark come over right away. So this is me waiting for a shark to come re ready to move that piece of rope at any second because, again, we don't want to feed the sharks. We just want to attract them closer. So the next thing you might be thinking is what do we do once the sharks are over there? Well, we move the bait out of the way at the very last second, as you can see here, and then we collect data. So that's why we needed the sharks really close. We wanted them close to the boat so we could do things like take pictures of their dorsal fins. If you all take a moment and look at your fingers, you can see your fingerprints, and they're all very unique, just like the dorsal fin of a shark. So we can know from that information the difference between one shark and another. Um, other information that we would collect is um, information on how big the shark is, if it's a male or a female, um, and that will all help us understand more about the types of sharks that are there. Now from there, I went on to do work in San Francisco. So I know that we have people from all over the country and even all over North America. So just to give you guys an idea, San Francisco is around the middle of the state of California, right where that red circle is. Um, I have a nice picture of the view of San Francisco. It's a huge city, but it's also, as you can see, surrounded by water. And not everyone realizes all the sharks that live there. And then, like I said before, I do a lot of outreach, so that's why I have that fun picture of me with a couple of um, left sharks. <laughs> that was pretty fun. Now, I also study a part of San Francisco, um, or I should say a part that's near San Francisco, and it's called the Farallons. So if you follow my white arrow, you can see that there is San Francisco, and then a little bit further over is this teeny tiny island called the Southeast Farallons. And if we look up at the top uh, left corner of the uh, slide, you can see that that's a much better picture of what the Farallons looks like. And then if we go over to that really pretty picture, that's what it looks like in real life. So you can see it's a very small island in the middle of the ocean. 
and great white sharks surround it. So my job was actually working on a cage diving boat. So I had a lot of roles on the, on the boat. Sometimes I would uh, help with the cooking, but really my role on the boat was a naturalist. So what we do is we have a sealed decoy. You can see that's what I'm about to throw out in the middle photo. And we have a big cage. So we'd have people from all over the world come over, get into that cage, looking for great whites. Now, one thing that's important to notice is that in the first picture I showed you, I was chumming in South Africa. But in this picture, there was no chumming. And that is because this is a marine protected area. We, uh, um, so the government wants to keep it very pristine. And so what we were waiting for was for animals to naturally come by. So, besides working um, off in the ocean by San Francisco, like I mentioned before, I also worked in the bay. So there's a picture of me uh, getting ready to do some work in uh, San Francisco Bay. Um, another cool thing about this photo is that if you look very carefully at San Francisco Bay, you can see that it looks like a mermaid. So um, if you notice where my white arrow is, that's the head. Um, that's North San Francisco Bay. Over here is actually fresh water, and it's called the Delta, and that's her ponytail. Central Bay, which is where I am in that photo, is her body. And then South San Francisco Bay is her fishtail. So I always thought that kind of looked neat. And there's no scientific facts there. I just like it. Now, here are some facts. These are some of the sharks that live in San Francisco Bay. And this was my first introduction to working with sharks that weren't great white sharks. And what I was starting to realize is that we have a huge diversity of sharks in our world. They can look very different. They can play a lot of different roles. And they're all very important. And over time, I started to realize that even as cool and arguably cooler than great white sharks. So you can see down here, there's an angel shark. And this angel shark, this angel shark looks like, um, a, you know, doesn't look like a normal shark. It looks like maybe a stingray. Um, we have soup fin sharks, and if you look at them from down below, you can see the light shining through their nose, so their noses kind of glow sometimes, like Rudolph. Leopard sharks have these beautiful color patterns. Seven gill sharks can get just as big um, as some of the smaller great whites, so like 10 feet, 9 to 10 feet long, 300 pounds, eating seals. But if you look closely at their mouths, they look like old men without teeth, so not very scary. Um, and then we have some of these other sharks that are brown smooth hounds. Um, now the pictures that you see here are me working with some of these sharks out in San Francisco Bay, collecting data on them and uh, getting a chance to uh, mark them so that way we can understand a little bit about their populations. And in these pictures, um, you can see that these sharks are out of the water. But what I want to point out is that um, these pictures are moments frozen in time. But really what was happening is a lot of fast action and these sharks were out of the water for anywhere between um, a couple of seconds um, to at the most a minute. And when they're out for a minute, we usually have um, a tube of water that goes through their gills, which you can't see in these photos. So the other thing that's important when you're learning about these sharks is understanding why they hang around and why they don't. So in these photos, what you see is us um, collecting data on water samples and trying to find out is the water cold right now? Um, is the water warm? And what else is in the water? Because these are some of the things that will help us understand um, why sharks go bay and why they leave. So uh, another question is uh, why I think my work is important. Well, as I started to learn more about these lesser known species, um, I learned about a term that my professor coined called lost sharks. Now, I just want to warn you, if you look up lost sharks online, I'm not talking about uh, sci-fi movies or conspiracy shows. What I'm actually talking about are lesser known species of sharks. Um, this is an article um, that my professor was interviewed for for NBC. Um, now, I'll admit that I can't hear you, but if anybody can call out what that shark is right here in this picture, go ahead and do it now. 
and I bet you all said hammerhead. So what that means is that this is not the best and truest representation of a lost shark. This is. This right over here is a type of ghost shark, and um, it is part of the cartilaginous fish family. So those are sharks that don't have um, animals that don't have skele uh, bones for skeletons. They have something that's much more bendy. Uh, this is a very close cousin to sharks, but not a true shark, but it is part of that bigger group. So that's why we call it a lost shark. Now, these are some actual other sharks that exist. So I wanted you guys to take a look at the names. Um, obviously, they don't look like the cartoons here, but the cartoons are a great way to remember, remember what they are. So we have a lollipop cat shark. That's a real thing. A mouse cat shark. Green lantern shark, like a superhero. A mud cat shark. A pajama shark. And a mandarin shark. Now I want to show you the photos of what these really look like. So there is the lollipop cat shark. There's that cute little mouse cat shark, the green lantern shark, the mud cat shark. You can see it's very brown. The pajama sharks. So it's got those fun stripes like your pajamas. And then the mandarin dogfish. So not a lot of people know about these species of sharks, but they're actually very interesting. Some of them need a lot more protection than white sharks, and some of them have only been seen once or twice in the entire um, time that people have studied them. So once or twice ever. So the way a lot of this starts, I want to tell you a little bit about how um, I got involved with lost sharks, lost sharks, and it starts with a museum and a jar. So that means that you don't have to live by the ocean to study lost sharks. Only problem though, sometimes when you're looking at these sharks in jars, they can look a little old and uh, decrepit. This is a picture of um, a shark that's been in a jar for five years, and this is what it looked like straight out of the jar. What you're looking at was my chance to help discover a brand new species of shark. And that may not be the story you might have been thinking of. Sometimes people think that my story of discovering a new species was I was swimming in the ocean and I turned around and then there was this brand new species. Nope, the story actually starts in a museum. And so what I had to do was look at all the special features of that shark, counting the dorsal fins. You can see some sharks might have two, while others have one. Whoops. And then after that, I had to look at special things like the shark I had could glow in the dark and it had spines. And so what you're looking at here is an order of sharks called the dogfish sharks. And after note, looking at all those special features, I knew I had a type of lantern shark, a shark that had two spines on its dorsal fins, had a glowing belly. But here is another picture of these lantern sharks. So you can see in this picture on the right, the glowing bellies. These spines on the dorsal fins, which were a key characteristic. And here's some cool photos of the species that I helped discover. Now, some of you might know the name of this shark. And I'll tell you what it is in a second if you don't. But I want to tell you a little bit about who helped me name this shark. It was the science, well, that's me. <laughs> Sorry, I'll tell you those, those pictures next. But uh, this is what it was like to discover that shark. So I had to do things like look at it very closely. So in this picture on the right, uh, you can see me with a magnifying glass. Uh, this is one of the other scientists, one of the shark experts that helped me discover it. And in this picture, I'm taking these teeny tiny measurements to find out how big are the eyeballs? How big is the whole body? How big is the, um, the, the tail of the shark? And all these teeny tiny measurements help me prove that it's a brand new species of shark. And one of the things I want you to notice in these pictures is that it's not a very big shark. So the brand new species of shark I discovered is less than two feet long. Okay, so now that fun part I was trying to get to, I wanted to show you who helped name this brand new species of shark, and it was them. These are my little cousins. Um, 
I had them come over to the museum. They looked at the specimens in close detail. We talked about all the things that were special about the shark, like the fact that it's jet black, that it doesn't glow as other as brightly as other sharks. And that is how they came up with the Ninja Lantern Shark. So this is the shark here. And it was also named after Peter Benchley, who wrote Jaws. And so that's why you see this picture here that looks just like the Jaws poster. We named it after him because he actually does a lot of conservation work, or he did in the past, uh, that people um, aren't as aware of. So we thought it would be a good tie into lost sharks. So I'm going to go a little bit faster now, um, but I just wanted to show you guys just a quick reminder that I might be showing you a lot of really cool pictures of the highlights of my work, but the work that I do on a day-to-day -day basis is just like all of you. It's homework. It's studying. It's reading. It's looking at graphs. It's using math. It's understanding science and new science that I don't understand. So here's a picture of a graph. Here's a picture of me with lots of laptops. Um, here's a picture of me looking at the periodic table. So everything that you are all learning right now is all important if you're interested in science and sharks. It's important to know how to write. It's important to um, know how to read stuff that might be difficult and take notes and ask questions and that's everything that i do every day um, but now let me tell you about one more fun trip that i just came back from when you do your homework and you do it well that's when you get to go on fun trips because you um it helps people know that you can be a good scientist so i went to japan so here's north america where we all are i went across the pacific ocean to this little continent here and this is Japan. So I went to a place in Japan. Um, this is Tokyo right here. This is the, the big famous city of Japan. And right under Tokyo is a little place that I went called Minamiboso. So this is what Minamiboso looked like. Very beautiful um, and rocky areas. Uh, cold, that's why I'm wearing this hat. I found some caves, which were neat. I found a $100 yen shop, which is like a dollar store, which I thought was funny. Uh, you can't tell very well in this picture, but it's a map of Tokyo Bay, which is where I, I got to study. So I went from San Francisco Bay to Tokyo Bay, which is really cool. Here's some of the animals that I studied. It was very cold, so that's why I'm wearing this um, this get up here. I got to find uh, sea spiders and neat little crabs that looked furry and these really cool sea stars. I got to find eels. This is a snipe eel. It's got this really long mouth. This is called a ratfish, just like a soup fin shark. It's got this nose that looks like it glows, which I thought was really neat. And as you might notice, the only shark in this picture is a shark backpack, and that's because I can't tell you anything about the sharks because it's going to be on Shark Week. So I was really excited that this was all filming for Shark Week, um, and you'll get to see a little bit about that more in uh, July, but I was looking for the lost sharks of Japan, and it was really fun. So I uh, just want to wrap up quickly with how all of you can help. Um, you can avoid your single-use plastics. Now, I know that sounds weird because um, you're not all by the oceans, but these teeny tiny plastics, they come in through the waterways and they end up in the oceans forever. So trash gets to the oceans through all our riverways, and we have a lot of different types of riverways and watersheds. And so even if you're hundreds of miles away from the ocean, the waterways Come, the fresh water comes to the oceans and it will bring that trash there. So if you want to help sharks, you're going to really help them a lot by making sure your trash goes into the right place. So every time you take a piece of trash off from the floor and put it into the trash, uh, trash can, uh, I just want you to remember that it may not seem like it, but you're completely helping sharks. So with that, I'm all done, and I'll take some questions. Uh, this is just a fun little comic strip. The Ninja Lantern Shark was a really popular name. It got on TV and even on the Sunday paper. So if you all have uh, papers at your homes, if you look on the back, you might have a comic strip called Sherman's Lagoon, and they did a strip on the Ninja Lantern Shark. And you can also find this on their website. So at this point, I'm going to stop sharing which back. now that I made it disappear. Oh, good. I came back. Great. <laughs>
All right. So thank you so, so much, Vicki. Uh, before we go to question and answer with the classes that are with us live, we have quite a few viewers that are watching the YouTube link online. If there are any classes okay. among them and they have any questions, they can send those questions in the YouTube chat bar and I'll ask uh, Vicki directly. But while we're here, if we want to go to Mrs. Templeton's class, if you guys have a question, go right ahead. Okay, I'm ready. Hello. Uh, Hi. Have you have you found a species of a new shark in this past week? Maybe, but uh, that's all I can say. So um, my uh, my lab discovers new species of sharks every year. Um, my professor found one called the Papuan uh, lantern shark, and they even found one that I believe they called La. Uh, uh, Lena's, Lana's uh, lantern shark um, in Hawaii. And uh, we might have found some new things in Japan, but that's top secret information that you just got. Okay. Good question. We won't tell anyone. <laughs> Don't tell anybody. <laughs> Mr. Uh, Baudouin's class, if you guys have a question, come on up. Hello. Hi. 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 My name is Sophie, and I was wondering. How do you fit the sharks in the jars that you mentioned earlier? Oh, that's a really good question. So one thing about sharks is that they're not all big like you see on TV. The smallest shark in the world is as big as this toy shark. Isn't that small? So the reason some sharks can fit in jars is just because they're really tiny. If you go to some museums, though, for the really big stuff like that you see on TV, they'll have these, like, huge tanks, and that's where they live. But the reason I can put them in jars is because a lot of them are actually really small. Good question. Excellent. All right. Uh, Mrs. Robertson's class, if you guys have a question. Okay, Tess. Um, can you hear us? Yep. I can hear you. Hi. What's Tess. your favorite type of shark? Oh, I'm so glad you asked me that. Okay, my favorite type of shark is called a cookie cutter shark because it won't kill you, it just leaves a scar. Doesn't that sound weird? It's the shark that's about this big. Hi. And it swims around, and if it finds something that it wants to eat, it only takes a chunk the size of a cookie, and it's a little circle shape, and then it goes away. So the animals that it eats it only takes off a piece. So it leaves them basically like a tattoo. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, all right, Mrs. Hastings Spec class. What? Go right ahead. Hi. Hi. Did you want to be a scientist since you were a kid? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, I always wanted to work with animals first. And then I decided I didn't want to be a vet because I was afraid of all the blood. <laughs> so I went to sharks. <laughs> um, and I got into the science part um, the more I learned about animals. And that is classic scientist. A lot of times what scientists do is they look around their environment and they start to ask questions and then they use science. So I had a lot of questions and those questions may be interested in science. So thanks. Thanks for asking that. I like that one. Awesome. Let's go back through. So Mrs. Templeton's class, you guys have another question. Yep. How many species of sharks are there in the world? Oh, that's such a good question. There is over 500 species of sharks. Um, I think we're closer to over 530 now. There were two species of sharks just discovered this week. Two types of dogfish sharks, I believe in uh, Australia it might have been. Um, and then those lantern sharks that I mentioned too. So, good question. And possibly more secret sharks that you haven't told us about that are going to show up on Shark Week. So. Secret sharks, yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right, uh, Mr. Baudrin's class, you guys have a second question? Do. Hi. Hi, my name is Courtney, and I was wondering, um, how old do you have to be to study sharks? Oh, I'm so glad you asked that. You can actually be any age. So this is the cool thing. Everybody write this down. Citizen scientist. Anybody can be a citizen scientist, and scientists really love it 
when you do this because we need your help. Basically, every time you go outside, you're looking around nature. You might see a bird that you don't think is a big deal, but there's some scientists somewhere that would have loved to know that you saw that bird. So what you can do is you can take pictures of these different types of animals and you can report back to different scientists that are trying to collect that data. So for, for my lab, we are looking for um, basking sharks, which are the second largest shark in the entire world, and they only eat plankton. And where I'm also looking for hammerhead sharks. So sharks that look like this one right here. So if you ever see hammerhead sharks in Southern California, um, I would love to know that too. Um, if you're not by the ocean and you still want to help with sharks, uh, the other thing that you can do is you can be a science communicator. So you can help teach people about sharks and tell them the real facts because I bet some of you know a person that thinks that sharks are really dangerous and if you see any shark, it's going to hurt you. So if you can help tell people some of the real facts, that is a great start to being a scientist without ever having to get by the water. Good question. Thank you. I hope you guys will help. <laughs> A great answer. Uh, all right, Mrs. Robertson's class, if you guys have another one. You can stand up, Jacob. Why do you think it's important to study sharks? Ooh, really good question. Um, the reason I think that it's important to study sharks is because a lot of people have a sincere fascination with sharks. Like, for you all, I bet sometimes you have a favorite thing, like a favorite animal or a favorite color, but you don't always know why. You just know it's this thing that you really like. Maybe it's something you really like to do. And sharks are like that for a lot of people. And so we can take advantage of this by teaching people about sharks as a way to teach about the entire ocean. Because there are some animals out there that people may not think are as cool as sharks, but they're just as important. So you can use sharks as this really great tool to help protect everything. And that's why I think it's important. Awesome. All right, Mrs. Hastings Specs class. Um, Hi again. Hey, uh, how many different kinds of species did you uh, of sharks did you discover in your lab? For me personally, just one. But my lab of the um, over 500 species that I was telling you all about, my lab has discovered about 15 percent of that. Um, my lab is the second largest lab in the entire world for discovering new species of sharks. And as I mentioned before, it's not just the true sharks, it's also their cousins. So I have a lab mate who's defending her thesis in a couple of days, and it's really cool because if you look online for ghost sharks, she's holding this really big species of ghost shark in her hands, one of the biggest ones we've ever seen before. My lab also helps discover and learn about uh, new species of um, stingrays and even torpedo rays. Now torpedo rays are cool if you ever have a chance to look this up because they're electrical so they give out shocks to things in their environment. And so if I were to put a, a number to how many species um, my lab has discovered when we combine the true sharks and all their cousins, whew, it is uh, definitely over 30 and it's growing every month. So it's a lot. So before we go to the third round of questions, Vicki, I have to ask, do you like sharks? Like is, we're getting that sense, I think. Just want to confirm. I like sharks a lot. I'm really glad that I'm talking of all of you today in a shark theme because I definitely talk about sharks way too much when I'm not supposed to. <laughs> so I'm glad I can get it out this morning. <laughs> awesome. All right. Uh, Mrs. Templeton's class. You guys have a third question. What is the biggest shark in the world? Oh, okay, that's such a fun question. The biggest shark in the entire world is a whale shark. And the reason I think that is super cool is because it eats the smallest things in the world. So this shark that gets like 
50 feet long, eats teeny tiny plankton. Um, if any of you watch SpongeBob, that's plankton from SpongeBob. Um, and if you're ever looking at water, like if you ever, you may not all be by an ocean, but you might be next to uh, river streams and lakes. So if you get a little cup of water and you put it to the sunlight so you can see all the dots and specks in it, that's plankton. And that is what whale sharks eat in the ocean. Awesome. All right, uh, Mr. Bowden's class, go right ahead if you guys have a third question. Go ahead. Why are they translucent? Why are they the shark, ninja lantern sharks trans translucent? Translucent teeth, right? Why are yeah. They, why is their teeth? Oh, why do they have trans? Oh, okay. So. Um, the reason that they have uh, the teeth that they do, the reason they look a little translucent is because ninja lantern sharks are very small. They are just a little bit bigger than this, so maybe like that big. And so because of that, their teeth are really thin, and um, when you put them next to light, it looks like they're glowing. In fact, when we were coming up with names for uh, the Ninja Lantern Shark, we were coming up with some names about the teeth because they look so cool. Now there's another thing about the teeth that you may not notice. If you look at the teeth again, the top teeth do not look like the bottom teeth. And that is because the top teeth are used more for grasping onto the food and then the bottom teeth help cut it. So they have some really, really cool teeth. If you guys all look at each other's teeth like this, you'll notice your bottom teeth and top teeth are exactly the same. So those sharks have some really crazy cool teeth. And then every time they lose them, they just replace them. Wouldn't that be cool if you could just keep getting nonstop rows of teeth? I think it'd be cool. <laughs> can eat so much more sugar that way. Uh, I know, right? <laughs> also, can I say I'm really glad you got the shark figurines because they've come in so handy so far. Yeah, I know. Yeah, it's fun. All right. I have three in case anyone. True diverse shark diversity. This one's a goblin shark. This is your typical great white or ambiguous shark. And then I got a little hammerhead. Nice. All right. <laughs> this is uh, Robertson's class. If you have a third question, come on up. Go ahead, Jen. Go ahead. Have you ever been in a shark tank and were you afraid? Um, I have been um, in a cage with great white sharks and I wasn't afraid. It was actually, it actually almost seemed boring. Okay, so it totally wasn't boring. But you know when you're watching TV and you see the sharks and they're like, Grah! and it looks really dramatic? It wasn't like that at all. The shark would come by and it'd go, boop, 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 boop. I was like, oh, okay, there it was. And then it'd go, boop, 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 boop. <laughs> so it was really cool because they were so big, but they're really, really calm and they weren't scary at all. So I wasn't scared. So last but not least, we'll go back to Mrs. Hastings Specs class. Um, how do how do shark work lay the eggs? What was that? Can you say it one more time? How does shark like lay their eggs? Oh, okay. Okay, so that's a really good question because sharks have different modes of reproduction. Some sharks, like a leopard shark. Uh, to us, it looks like they're having live babies. So just like a mammal, which is super crazy because they're not a mammal. So they have something going on internally that to us look like live birth. Now other sharks will have these really cool egg cases that they call mermaids purses because they have a little, they're like a square shape like a bag, and then they have these little tendrils on the top, like it's a handbag, and the tendrils tie and get caught up in, in like seaweed and seagrasses, so that way it doesn't float away and escape. Now the coolest one though are um, the eggs of like horn sharks, um, and that is because, and I'll use this, this one again, They'll take this thing that's like shaped like a screw, so really like a lot of turns, really twisty, and they'll put it in their mouth, and then they'll very carefully go somewhere like in a rock, 
and they'll very carefully twist it and and squish it into a spot so that way it can't um, it can't float away. So those are some of my favorite types of uh, shark cakes. Excellent. And at the end, too, for the classes, I'll send a link so you can see some pictures of room really neat shark eggs, like the screw. Uh, so you can check that out in a minute. For now, what I'm going to do is I'll turn off, I'll demute all the microphones so that all you classes can say a big thank you to Vicki. So, Ms. Templeton, Baudouin, Robertson, and Hastings Speck, if you want to say thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Know, you. That was so great to hear, everybody. <laughs> yeah, it was a great hangout. Great questions, guys. So for everyone, if you guys want to learn more about Sharks too, we have many more hangouts throughout the week. You can also go to sharksforkids.com or look up Vicky and see what her work's going on. Uh, as she mentioned earlier too, she'll be featured during Shark Week with some hopefully maybe new species of shark. So Very, yeah, new, rare, who knows what it's going to be. So. You know, giant, megalodon, we don't know. Uh, so thank you so, so much for joining us. Have a lovely rest of your day, everyone. Thanks so much. <laughs>